Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this session. Um, my title, I have to say, was given to me, so I have kind of extended this a little bit, and we will talk about uh, some of the things that go on with the changes in how many owners wish to look at food for their pets, often reflected by, as Michael said, changes that have gone on with how they're looking at their own diets, which is often this. So one thing we all hear a lot about is, is gluten. This is, this is sort of the new evil, isn't it? Is gluten sort of for everything. And this is actually, I didn't take a picture of it, but I found this on the web. I did see this sign in a train station, which will remain nameless, in one of the coffee shops, which I thought was extremely brave of them. They didn't leave it there very long, and I didn't get a picture of it. And it's kind of funny, but it's kind of offensive. If you are a true celiac, then this is kind of offensive, that a lot of people are self-diagnosing, including one of my relatives, um, that they have this. So I want to talk a little bit about what is it about gluten? What is it about wheat? What we actually do know. So wheat-related disorders in people, I'll start with, because this is where people are extrapolating from, I think, from wheat disorders in people to their pets. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the little bit that we do actually know in pets. So prevalence in Europeans, which we still are included in, uh, is about half to 2%, depending on, on which study you look at. So it's True wheat intolerance is actually pretty uncommon. Um, so there are, depending on what you read, there's different ways of categorizing this. There, there are probably roughly three different types. And one is true celiac disease, which is a disorder of the small intestine, so the signs will be small intestinal. Um, there are serological tests for that. There's a couple of blood tests done for that, tissue transglound. I knew I was going to botch that, transglutaminase um, and deaminated gliatin peptide. The gliadin, oh, the pointer doesn't work on this. The gliadin is the one we've, we've known is probably the culprit. It's one of the types of, of proteins within gluten. Um, sometimes duodenal biopsies are helpful with this. Sometimes they're not. There's also a test called anti-gliadin antibodies, which has a high sensitivity, so it will work as a screening test. If you have celiac disease, this will probably be positive, but if you don't have it, it might be positive too, so it's not that good a, a specificity. It will probably, if this test is positive, excuse me, if the test is negative, you probably don't have it. If it's positive, you may or may not have it, so it would be kind of a, a screening test to do for that. The next one that falls under this category is a, an actual wheat allergy, which is an immunoglobulin E or a very immediate sensitivity to wheat. I do think I have seen one dog with this. We didn't prove it. We didn't have the technology at the time I saw this dog. But um, if the owner fed him a wheat product, this dog vomited immediately. It's the only one that I think truly fit this category. And I can't prove it was this. He didn't really have the rest of the signs with that. Uh, the one that we quite haven't defined well yet in people, that they do think there's a non-celiac gluten sensitivity or something, um, because in some cases this may not be due to gluten. So it's a gluten sensitivity that might not be due to gluten, so you can tell even the medics haven't quite categorized this very well yet. But this is the one that possibly a lot of people are self-diagnosing. Um, I have GI signs. If I don't eat wheat products, I feel better. However, some of them might be due to other products in wheat, not gluten. So calling it a gluten sensitivity might be wrong. Um, it may be, according to some articles, what's called FODMAPs, food maps, FODMAPs, I actually don't know how the correct pronunciation, um, which is fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. I think they just put the A in so you can pronounce it. Um, these are things that are in wheat products. They're also possibly in vegetables and fruits, especially the polyols. They're in, in uh, things like rye, beans. So. They're, in a, they're potentially in a lot of different foods. So somebody who's just cutting wheat products, you know, I won't eat bread because it is bad, and then has some fruit, still could show signs. Uh, and in my personal experience with my brother, he says, oh, there must have been gluten in that. So a lot of people still don't necessarily understand what's going on with that and the, the reaction against, you know, all wheat is bad. They might be looking at this wrong. Now, the problem with the self-diagnosing, that is, really very, very common with this, I think, um, which the celiac is the new black. Everybody, when they have a GI thing, says, oh, well, I'll take gluten out of my diet. Um, 
is that if you remove, especially if you remove everything with wheat products in it, especially if you go on to try to remove the fruits, the legumes, all these other products out of your diet, um, you're probably going to end up with some nutritional deficiencies. So if somebody wants to do this, they really need to be consulting a human nutritionist dietitian to make sure they're doing it correctly. Actually, I would say anybody who's self-diagnosing a dietary problem needs to be talking to a trained NHS dietitian, not, not a quack on the corner, and there's plenty of those in both human and veterinary medicine. Um, so they need to be talking to someone who actually is trained in this area and not like a two-week course online trained, but properly trained in it. So that's my bit about the human side of things. So we'll move on to dogs and cats. Um, we've known for quite a few years that some, and I realized when I was looking at these slides this morning, I should have put some in here, not all iris setters, but some iris setters do appear to have a gluten sensitive um, enteropathy, small intestinal problem. Uh, these dogs have increased intestinal permeability in a bad way, uh, and that it's a genetic transmission. So if you have a dog with this, you probably don't want to breed them. Um, and we've known about this for quite a while. There's been quite a few papers written about this gl gluten sensitivity in Irish setters. More recently, um, there's been a paper on epiloid cramping syndrome in border terriers, also called Spike's disease, because I think Spike was the first dog diagnosed with it. Um, this is not a fatal disease. The dogs are very uncomfortable. They literally have kind of a spasmodic sort of a, uh, a syndrome with it that's very uncomfortable for the dogs. There's been a study looking at the serum IgA titers in these dogs, which are elevated. The serum, that's the transglutamase um, TG, T, TG2 IgA titers, which are also elevated, uh, and the IgG titers. So these dogs literally do have an immune response, and it appears to be to gluten um, in these dogs when they have uh, put these dogs on a gluten-free diet that signs resolve. Now, if you have an owner with a border terrier who's read about this, of course, their response is going to be, put the dog on a gluten-free diet, right? Okay, which is good. The dog might, will probably improve if this is really what he has. However, you then cannot test for it. You have to test the dogs when they've been eating gluten, otherwise they won't have the, the immunoglobulins against it because it's no longer there. So just be aware um, if you get questions about this, if people want to test for it, if the owners have already changed the diet and they're happy with it, they just need to go on with that because the tests won't, will no longer be positive. So this is one of the, these two are the best examples that I know of, of a true, probably a gluten sensitivity in dogs. That and the one, uh, the one Sharpe that I had, uh, as not my own dog, thank God, uh, the, the Sharpe client that I had who had eosinophilic uh, IBD and also did seem to respond better to removing wheat from his diet. But that was kind of an unscientific way that I did that part of it as far as doing any testing for specific allergies to wheat. So far, there's no evidence of gluten intolerance in cats, as far as I know, which is interesting because we always talk about, oh, cats are you know, carnivores and they shouldn't have any grain and all this. But we, I've yet to see a report of gluten intolerance in a cat. I do get queries about putting cats on gluten-free diets um, for usually GI problems or skin problems. I, I guess my response would be, yes, we can do a diet trial, but if the cat's already been on a hydrolyzed diet or some other diet that really wanes out food problems and hasn't improved, I don't think this is going to make a difference for them. And for those of you who can't read that, it says, this has nothing to do with gluten. It says, meowed incessantly for half an hour and got food. Um, this is one of the things that happens with the humanization is how our animals are training us. Okay, grain-free diets kind of related to the gluten-free idea. I get lots of questions about, I want to put my animal on a grain-free diet. Um, they are, you know, evolved from a wolf or a lion. <coughs> Their cats are not evolved from lions, by the way. There's, that's not where they came from. They came from a very small, well, not very small, larger than our cats, a uh, cat in North Africa, Felis sylvestricus, Libicus. Um, but people kind of get this, if it's natural, it's good. Michael mentioned the word natural. Otherwise, we have this concept that natural equates with good. Amanita mushrooms are natural. They will kill you. Natural is not always good. We also don't have a definition 
of natural. It doesn't have a legal definition. Anybody can call anything natural pretty much because nobody's going to sue you for it because it's not unless there's things have changed. Um, there's some guidance in the human the sector. Guidance, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah but the Food we, Standards Agency, but it's not a... Yeah, it isn't, it isn't really enforced. So. Um, so this is sort of considered a more natural diet, although dogs and cats can digest cooked grains. I don't think I'd feed raw to myself or, or dogs or cats. Um, and grain-free may not mean carbohydrate-free, and some owners don't get that there are grains, excuse me, that there are carbohydrates like potatoes, which are not grains. So if they're looking for carbohydrate-free, this is not the same thing. Um, and if they do end up with a low-carb diet, which you're probably going to do if you do grain-free, yeah, you can use some other sources, but it's going to be high. There's only three pieces of the pie. I think Dr. Van Berde has uh, something similar on her slides, too. There's only three pieces of the pie that make up the calories that we take in. There's fats, there's proteins, there's carbohydrates. That pie has to be complete. You can't take a chunk out of it. Um, so if you increase one, you have to decrease one or two of the others. If you decrease one, you have to increase one or two of the others. So if you do, there's no pointer. If you do a low carb diet, well, corner down here, the low gray, um, your fat and your protein probably are going to go up. One or both of those have to go up. So grain-free diets. If you end up with a high fat diet, this could cause some problems. Um, pancreatitis in dogs, possibly even in cats. Uh, literature has been equivocal on that, but I think uh, I'd certainly have some colleagues who feel they have seen um, some problems in cats on very high fat diets. So uh, hypertriglyceridemia in dogs, uh, also in cats, especially if they are genetically predisposed to it, uh, as are, say, some of the Burmese cats. Obesity. Fat has over twice the calories of carbohydrates or protein, so if you have a high-fat diet, it's probably going to be a high-calorie diet. So, and especially if it's a high-saturated fat diet, that has all sorts of other ramifications that I don't have time to go on to. Basically, saturated fats are, are poison. That's a very biased view, and I, I can substantiate that, but I won't. High protein might be okay in some animals. I think you need to handle that carefully. Uh, in some cases, some of the, say, working dogs, uh, increased protein is probably not a bad idea. Some cats, if they're young and healthy, probably not, not a problem for them. But then if we get into an animal who maybe has subclinical renal disease, something like that, then we need to watch because with protein goes phosphorus. You need to realize high protein diet is going to be high phosphorus diet. And they, we have to ask the question, do we want this in this animal? A lot of the uh, renaliths, uh, uroliths, protein needs to be decreased. So we'd need to pick our patients carefully for that. And carbohydrates actually do have a good nutritional value. Um, they're pretty important during lactation. It's easier to make lactose from glucose than it is from fats or protein. So if you have a lactating uh, bitch or queen, it does help them with lactation. If you have a working dog, uh, not too many working cats, um, but if you have a dog who is either pulling sleds or even running short races or playing with Frisbee for hours, their first energy source, or one of their first energy sources, is the glycogen from their muscles uh, and then from their liver. The best way to replete that is with carbohydrates after they work, and it will become depleted as part of the reason for fatigue. So they, there are places where this is not only usable but essential. Okay, dry diets, we get lots of questions about. Cats shouldn't be on dry diets. Um, they're, they're too high in carbohydrate for cats, and they may be high in carbohydrates. Those of you who uh, are making foods know that if you're making a dry diet, especially with the extrusion process, I'm not a food scientist, so feel free to correct me, any of people who are, um, but it does help with that process to have an increased carbohydrate amount in those diets. And then we get the feeding dry diets causes obesity in cats. Um, yeah, if you feed all they want, it will. If you feed, if you eat all you want of anything, you will eventually probably gain weight unless you have an extraordinary metabolism. Um, so the, I think the thing with dry diets is they're easier to feed free choice, which might be why sometimes animals will gain weight because the food's always there and the cats kind of realize they can eat as much as they want. If it's highly palatable, then yeah, you'll gain weight. But it's not the dry diet itself. It's not the form of the diet necessarily causing it. 
they don't cause or increase the risk of diabetes mellitus in cats. Because we treat diabetes, type 2 diabetes mellitus in cats with a high protein, low carbohydrate diet, some people have gone on to say, well, then if we feed that low carb diet initially, they won't get it. They won't get diabetes. It's not that they won't understand it. Um, they won't get diabetes. Uh, it's a, intuitively, that's an understandable leap. Um, and because of that, because several nutritionists have studied exactly this, is this a cause? And it's not. The obesity is. The dry diet itself and the carbohydrates don't cause it, even though we treat um, with a low-carb diet. They don't cause it. Being fat does by a lot. Cholesterol, I'm going to do this one pretty quickly. Dogs and cats, uh, unless the dog is, or rarely a cat is hypothyroid, they do not develop atherosclerotic plaques uh, in their arteries. They do not develop coronary artery disease. Um, they've got some differences in the, their uh, LDLs and their types of cholesterol. That means they're protected from that compared to people. Um, if you do have a fat cat, their cholesterol might be higher. So if somebody measures a cholesterol in a fat cat, it's higher. It's not the cholesterol that's the problem. The obesity is the problem. And I, yeah, I have a couple of vets who have consulted with me um, about owners who get very hung up um, about the cholesterol value of their pet. I've got one dog and one cat, but the owners keep coming back going, this cholesterol is high. And my answer to that generally is deal with the other problems and quit, quit measuring it. It's just like, don't, don't do that anymore. You know, get away from it because it's not really probably causing a problem as far as we know. Okay, what pet foods contain? I might run over a little, Michael. Just yell at me if I do. I'll cut to the end. Um, how many of you actually work for a pet food company or involved in a pet food company? Okay, most of you. So this is, I'm, I knew I'd be preaching to the choir a little bit here, but I'm sure you've all heard these. For anybody that hadn't heard these, these are all rumors that I have run across. This one is so bizarre, I don't know where people come up with this. They contain roadkill, they contain dead pets. One that'd be highly unethical, and secondly, it would be not a very sustainable way to make a pet food to kind of drive up and down the road to pick up, you know, <laughs> kill deer and birds and things off the road. That is just the most bizarre rumor. Um, because... That's not a very good, reliable source, is it? Fillers. This one I get all the time. Is, oh, they want to use, I don't want to use a commercial food because they contain fillers. I've yet to have a good definition of a filler. I actually don't know what people think is in their sawdust. I really don't know what they think is in there. I think it's carbohydrates, I think, or fiber, which are both nutrients that are beneficial for health. Carbohydrates and nutrient fiber is very essential for a lot of things, especially for the health of the colon unless you have food mop gluten sensitivity. Um, so that one mostly just bemuses me. Byproducts, yeah, byproducts are in pet food. Unused products from, and I actually took this from the PFMA website. Thank you, Michael. By, for, for use unused products from the human food industry where animals are slaughtered under veterinary supervision, including things like heart, lung, might be muscle meat, which are not traditionally eaten by people in this country or whatever country you're referring to. I think they mean England, actually, because I live in Scotland. We eat some things that other people might not be eating. Uh, yeah, we eat, you know, stomachs of cows and blood and some other things that in, other, in some cultures would definitely be considered byproducts. So the other thing about byproducts, they're a very sustainable and green use of slaughtered animals. Otherwise, what are we going to feed animals if we don't feed them byproducts? We're going to feed them food products that could go into the human food chain. That's actually not a good idea. So either we need to not feed those products to animals, not use animals, or quit reproducing so bloody much and cut down the population because we can't have it all three ways. So when you get anybody complaining about the use of byproducts, I think this, along with it being pretty healthy sources of protein and, and, and other nutrients, um, it's a very, very green way to approach this because we're not wasting an animal that's going to be slaughtered anyway. Uh, we had a little argument about whether or not I got to include this one, but because I get this a lot, bones are good for teeth. Um, basically, the animals might enjoy chewing bones. They do not prevent periodontal disease, and they can um, potentially fracture teeth. There's been, there are a couple studies I'll mention just quickly. There's been others uh, looking at 
wild or feral animals who eat a quote unquote natural diet. In other words, they're eating the entire carcass, including bones. They still have periodontal disease. They have teeth wearing. They have teeth fractures, both in cats and dogs. Oops, there's my other reference. Um, and it might improve the appearance of the teeth. Those of you who do feed bones, if anyone does, so I'd say, oh yeah, my, my dog or possibly cat's teeth look better. Yeah, they can, that's very true, because it will help decrease the amount of calculus or tartar on the teeth. That's actually only cosmetic. And yes, it looks pretty and that's nice, but it is only cosmetic. It is not related to the health of the animal. So it doesn't decrease plaque. Plaque is what causes periodontitis and tooth loss. Plaque is the evil thing, not the calculus. Plaque is harder to see. I have a dentist friend, sorry everybody to doing this, this early in the morning I have a, a veterinary dentist friend who says, plaque's the stuff you can scrape off with your fingernail in the morning. That is the, that is the stuff that causes periodontitis and tooth loss. So not the calculus, bones don't help. There's been quite a few studies, there was just a recent Beagle study that again proved improvement in calculus, nothing on plaque. Uh, and that's just sort of my picture again stolen from a dentist, pointer that doesn't work. With teeth that don't look too bad, but the gums look absolutely awful, that's periodontitis. That dog's in danger of losing what appears to be a pretty clean tooth. Um, other thing I get is sometimes diets that people have put together and say, well, I'm giving him bones for the calcium. Chewing on an entire bone that they are not chewing up does not provide calcium. It provides entertainment, but it doesn't provide nutrients. Um, I just to, oh, I want to go back just a second on this one. This is actually a recipe that I found on the web for a vegan diet for a dog, which includes a banana, some peas, a sweet potato, and some quinoa. Dr. Billy Bader and I could have a good time pointing out the multiple nutrient deficiencies in this dog. That is absolutely horrific. Um, but this is something purported on the web, which has no valid validity at, at all as... <coughs> Unfortunately, if you pull up websites for dog food or cat food, you get a lot of, I'm trying to think of a word I can say on camera. Um, anyway, you get a lot of that, that I wouldn't believe. So you can formulate a vegetarian diet for dogs. If this is done by the owner, they need to do it very carefully. And Ceci's going to talk about uh, problems with formulating foods. There's a lot of nutrients that need to be checked, about 40 for cats, 37 for dogs. Owners aren't gonna get that by accident and trial and error or feeding from a recipe on the web. Please don't do it in cats. This is a cat that um, we had when I was in practice in New Zealand. This was a vegetarian fed cat. The other two cats in the household hunted, so they protected themselves. This is an adult cat. Uh, that's a picture of his owner's guru, that he wanted his cats to follow his religion and his ethics. And this cat, it was a lovely sweet little cat, emaciated. He was so weak that he could not stand up. Um, and basically we cured this cat by feeding him cat food. My, uh, my mentor and boss down there um, has a strong personality and actually made this owner sign an affidavit that he would feed this cat cat food before he was released back into the owner's care because we didn't want to see this poor, very sweet little cat come back in in this condition again. So just, it's not even, I can pretend to make up a diet like this, just don't do it. And this is my own um, commercially fed cat. He's very happy, he's very healthy. He's now nearly going on 14. 